We're still here in the Digital Weather Center at News 6 talking about Hurricane Aaron. You'll be surprised how long this system has stuck around with us. And to tell you the truth, I, quite frankly, am a little tired of the name Aaron coming out of my mouth. But we've got another few days to spend alongside this system that's grown to such a massive size. Thankfully, no immediate landfall threat to anybody in the United States or Canada but we are continuing to see considerable coastal concerns and impacts as the system continues to broaden out as it moves off towards the north, preparing to make that curvature back towards the northeast. And I bring to you today a bit of a large-scale update in terms of how the second half of the hurricane season could possibly behave as we get closer to September 1st. The bell, according to Dr. Bill Gray has rang as of yesterday. This is when we really start to ascend that mountain towards the climatological peak of the season on September 10th, and that's going to be happening in the next two and a half weeks. And I'm here to tell you that alongside Hurricane Aaron and what we're tracking out there right now, that very well looks to be when things could activate all over again. But first, let's take a look at Hurricane Aaron. This is a massive storm with every bit of the term massive put into play here. If you look at the size of this system, it spans almost a 2,000 plus miles diameter. The center is almost immediately parallel to the Cape Hatteras coast there, as well as Bermuda off to the east-hand side of the center of circulation. But the satellite is put in this position to show you that we're starting to see upper-level cloud cover as far north as Atlantic Canada, and we're still seeing wraparound westerly flow on the south side of it here in central Florida. That's how huge this system is. You can, for all intents and purposes, say this thing is an eastern seaboard hurricane. Thankfully, staying offshore, we're still seeing some impacts, especially along the immediate beaches from central Florida all the way up. But nothing is going to be fully pushed inland. And you can see here, when you look at the latest info from National Hurricane Center, that tropical storm Winfield is currently buffeting the extreme eastern coastline of North Carolina and will continue to do so. But thankfully, per the 8 a.m. advisory, we're going to get another one in about 30 minutes. We're starting to pick up forward progress. We're finally scooting Aaron up out of here, moving north-northeast at 17 miles an hour, still at a Category 2 hurricane. Notice the central pressure is fairly low, though. That's because this is a very large rotation, a rotating ball of energy. So while the central pressure is deep enough to support major hurricane status, because this thing just isn't literally spinning fast enough to produce that kind of energy and wind, we're not seeing it, and we are going to start a steady weakening trend over the next several days. On top of that, you take a look at this. This is the life cycle of Hurricane Aaron. So if it feels like it's been around for pretty much all of August, it almost has. Formed back on 8 August, became a Category 5 approximately five or six days after that, and we're still kicking it with Hurricane Aaron. And we probably will continue to do so at least until Saturday, if not Sunday, once we really begin to make that transition to a non-tropical low pressure. And then August isn't quite done just yet. It looks like Fair Non is going to be hitting the board here any moment now. Our tropical chances over the next two days continue to rise for that area of interest, really starting to get its act together. You can see on the satellite image that first disturbance highlighted for a 40% shot of development in the next two days and 70% shot over the next seven days. I don't know how my things got flipped here. I'll go ahead and kind of make that adjustment alongside you. These formation chances belong to this little thing right there, the code red zone there. And these formation chances belong to Invest 99L, which has looked very healthy out there across the tropical Atlantic and is expected to continue to hold that characteristic until later on today, it looks like models are projecting we're going to see almost a complete dissipation of all the showers and storms around the mid and low level spin with that feature. And maybe based on some of the data we've gotten from our satellites orbiting the planet, taking screenshots of that feature, we might have missed at least a tropical depression out there. When you take a look at the satellite for these areas down across the main development region, I'm calling it the tropical train, we've got a parade of tropical waves coming off the coast of Africa. We have that first circle for this to the left. That's our area of interest likely to take on the name Fairnan. Those 40% chances over the next two days are probably going to continue going up from here on out. By tomorrow, we'll probably be up to 50, if not 60%. And then by Saturday, we may actually have a tropical depression, if not a tropical storm, already knocking on the door. That will follow in hot pursuit of Aaron, though. Will be no issue for just about anybody. A rainmaker for the Lesser Antilles. That second box to 
the center of your screen is going to be Invest 99L. Could still see a bit of a Hail Mary as it makes its way through the Caribbean, closer to Belize, the Yucatan Peninsula, and then into the southwest Gulf, the Bay of Campeche. Models are still kind of infatuated with the idea that maybe, and I know I'm using a lot of ifs and maybes and possibilities, I know, but it's a small signal, so I'm calling it the Hail Mary. It's going to be a little bit of a wild card. We'll have to watch over the next five or so days. And then we have two more tropical waves that, to tell you the truth, are going to run face first into very unfavorable conditions across the deep tropics. So those are not going to play a role in the rest of August, likely not to see development out of those. But we'll keep an eye both on 99L and especially that first area of interest that will likely receive the designation 90L over the next couple days as it further organizes. On top of that, hold on to your seat, folks. We're going to talk a little bit more about water temperatures. because you can see here, the Atlantic has really rebounded. We started this year with cooler than average temperatures, which is against the grain of the last few years, especially in the tropics from the Caribbean all the way to the coast of Africa. That has changed. That's changed big time, to tell you the truth. We now have a focusing of our warmest waters in the subtropical Atlantic and then especially through the Caribbean into the Gulf. I want to rule this area out, to tell you the truth. You can already see pockets of cooler shades, the blues, starting to creep up as a response to Hurricane Aaron moving through there. And we're going to see those blues extend further to the north into those deep shades of red underneath where that X is drawn, my yellow X. If Fernan does get going and develops into a tropical storm. Some computer models suggest it could even become a low-end hurricane as it moves just to the immediate east of Bermuda. That'll also help to take down some of those hot water temperatures. So why do I bring this up? If you look at hurricanes in their most basic fundamentals, hurricanes love heat. Where there's a lot of heat, tropical features are going to try to take that heat and move it towards the north. And as we get closer to the peak of the hurricane season, all of our hottest water temperatures are going to be right in through there. So am I predicting several named storms? Am I predicting things are going to start suddenly coming towards us? Not necessarily, but when you think about it from the most basic of ways in terms of the tropics versus up north, where there's a lot of heat, it has to go up north somehow, and tropical features are responsible for that. On top of that, the name of the game is the La Nina watch that's been issued thanks to Climate Prediction Center. So I take you over to the tropical Pacific and rock with me. I know this is a long-winded update. I do apologize, but I want to get everything out in one fell swoop. If you notice our water temperatures out here, we're still vastly cooler than average through the El Nino Southern Oscillation, your ENSO regions like this. They're kind of broken down into four different boxes. You have the four, the 3.4, then you have the three and then the one plus two regions closer to South America. We're still in something called a cold phase of the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. You see all this hot water up here closer to Alaska, Russia, and China. And then you have the cool anomalies wrapping back down into the tropical Pacific. That is that cool phase. This will typically help give the La Nina or the colder anomalies a little nudge and give them a bit more of an increase in the cool department. Because all of our hot water is loaded on towards the west or the left-hand side of your screen there, we're also going to see winds coming from Australia, Thailand, portions of southeastern China across the tropical Pacific that will further cool those water temperatures. So all in all, the Atlantic is warmed and the Pacific is trying to cool down. So what does that do? It's going to help to increase the potential for more tropical action. And what better time than during the peak of the hurricane season? So key takeaway here is we're going to go on a break. Probably once we wrap up these other little areas of interest out there, we have three out there, believe it or not, behind Aaron. Once those close out from about the 25th to maybe the 30th of August until the first five to seven days of September, crickets. Watch, you'll see. But then after that, it's going to get fairly interesting out there in pretty rapid fashion, I would think.